From the Dallas On Air Studios in beautiful Dallas, Texas, this is Fulfillment right here on DallasOnAir.com. And now here's your host, the Mega Bomber, PJ Dunn. Welcome, welcome. This is The Fulfillment Show. You know, the show where we discuss all things films. If you like talking about movies, if you like collecting movies, if you like saying my movie collection is bigger than your movie collection, then this is probably the show for you. Uh, this is episode two. So in episode two of season three, three seasons we've been going along with this here, Cole. Isn't that crazy? Right? And so with that, let me introduce some of the players here today. So to my right sits the Jedi Cole himself. Jedi Cole. Hey, everybody. <laughs> no, you haven't got the wrong Sunday. This is PJ show. <laughs> and that big booming voice you heard at the top was our man Kazak. Greetings and salutations. Campers working at DallasOnAir.com. But wait. That's not all. We have a special guest today back by either selective amnesia on my part or by popular demand, which is the way Christy would see it, is Christy the Jedi Goddess. Hi, Christy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Logan. <laughs> it's a big glorious voice. That's the voice. We're That's doing. what we needed. We needed a little bit of operaticness here in our opening. <laughs> so if, yes, again, there it is. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, today, what we're going to talk about is an original topic that was created by Kazak himself. We're going to talk about streaming services. But before we get into that, we're going to go ahead and jump into our first segment, which is, you know, if you've been watching for a while, which is just seen it, which is what we talk about, what we've recently just seen. So you get a sense of the kind of taste and the things that we watch. And so to kick that off, I want to start with the special guest herself, the Jedi <laughs> Goddess. <laughs> oh, well, that, that's that kind of left. The wrong, that was the wrong sound effect. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is correct. I, I'm that getting that off to a, the wrong sound effect. I'm getting, I'm getting off to a freaking stellar start today, man. There we are. There's my wiki, wiki, wiki. Yes. Somebody needs some coffee. This this is not my morning. This is not my morning. All right, who are we starting with? We start with the Christy, the Jedi goddess. Oh, okay, Christy. Ladies first. All right. Hi, Christy. Go ahead. Oh, hello, hello, <laughs> hello, everyone. <laughs> Christy, what did you watch this week? Uh, yes. So I have watched uh, WandaVision. I actually um, binged the first two episodes of when they were dropped. And then I, of course, caught up on the third episode as well. And you can see my full review on YouTube. Yes. Uh, WandaVision Jedi Goddess. But uh, yeah, I, I actually loved it. I, I know a little bit about the comic book background here. So for me, I already had kind of uh, anticipation for this. So getting to see it on Disney Plus and at the comfort of your home, it's always exciting. But, <laughs> <when> I, <laughs> but I actually really enjoyed it. It's weird. Um, it, it, it's totally pulling from many, many comic book entities, you can tell so far. Okay. We're only in episode three, but I'm very happy with the direction it's going. And most importantly, I love how Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany, both The Vision and uh, Scarlet Witch, respectively, mm -hmm. have really thrown themselves into these roles and different characters um, that were predominant in different decades of television slash sitcom history. So okay. I highly recommend it, and if you're not a comic book head, um, you can definitely go and check out some of my recommendations for some of the comic books on my deeper reviews that I do, and I help explain all of that if it yeah. makes it sound a little bit, makes more sense, basically. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Chrissy, and I haven't seen it, of course, yet, but it, just from what I've seen so far, just in the trailers, I see a little bit of the old 70s show Bewitched with Elizabeth Montgomery and Darren Stevens. Is there some similarities there with that? or There is. The first two episodes, the first episode really takes the 50s and the second episode is the 60s. The third episode is the 70s. Ah, okay. They actually consulted Dick Van Dyke um, wow. personally on how to uh, really achieve the feeling of those kind of that old Donna Reed, My Three Sons, Bewitched. There's definitely a very... Um, comparable amount of Dick Van Dyke slash Bewitched to those first two episodes. And yeah. that's what I loved about it because I didn't watch them originally, but I watched them on the reruns of them and I loved them as a kid when I watched them. So yeah. feeling that kind of same magic and that same kind of writing and the cadence uh, and the live studio audience. You can't yes. go wrong. Wow. 
That's impressive. And, and I think one of the things that was fascinating about the first three episodes is, as you say, the, the decades change, but also the sets change to reflect the sensibilities. Yeah. You have a very Dick Van Dyke show, you know, kind of winking at that set. Uh, in the mm -hmm. third episode, they are very much channeling the Brady Bunch. They are. They wow. are. 100%. It's like they stole pieces from all these different sets mm -hmm. and crammed them all together. So we get to go from black and white and then to, into Technicolor because Technicolor was just starting Absolutely to get big in the 60s. The first two are in black and white. And yeah. I love the fact that it has the Georgia logo, the state of Georgia uh -huh. film board logo, and it's in black and white. Nice. Or in monochrome. <laughs> Uh, one of the things, I don't know if anybody else noticed this. I, I guess you couldn't have yet. Yeah. Uh, the first and third episodes, Elizabeth Olsen has top billing. The second episode, Paul Bettany has top billing. Interesting. And I'm curious to see if that trend remains in the fourth episode with Paul. You'll never work in this town again. <laughs> I hope, I sincerely hope, fired his old agent back before Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Avengers really hit for him because that's a whole other story. Well, Chrissy, so you said so that... many Easter eggs on on oh, the show, though okay. it's incredible, both to nostalgia purposes mm -hmm. and to the comic books and to the characters. They're really doing uh, so far. I'm very happy with the blend. I'll call it that they're doing between the MCU, the comic book history, and the legacy there, and then of course paying homage to these great shows that very very Americana shows that a lot of people grew up with. Well, I also uh, want to touch on having seen all three episodes. I have vague familiarity with a lot of the history of Vision and Scarlet Witch, mm -hmm. but not intimate familiarity. And what is nice is coming up with that kind of mixed bag, I can say that you could have, it's a very approachable show. What I love about this, like a lot of the MCU, is they're starting to realize you can tell these tales and the people who are steeped in it go bananas. The people yes. who are casually aware go bananas. And the people who don't know any of this, it's still good storytelling. You don't have to know it all. And Hollywood was terrified of that dynamic for so hmm. long. So you're saying if I watch it, I will become a fruit. That's what you're saying. <laughs> Having seen the third episode, you might be right. Um, <laughs> Interesting choice of words. You should watch the third episode, and I'm not going to get anything away. <laughs> Excellent. But, yeah, there's a lot of, of uh, fresh produce involved. We'll say that. <laughs> well, we'll take it from that perspective then. Well, and, and Christy, you said something about the comics, and so it does touch in a bunch of major uh, storyline themes with Vision and Wanda, so that's going to be fun, I imagine. And I've read a little bit of their dynamic, Wanda and Vision, so I am kind of interested in seeing this. So you're giving it a thumbs up, is that right? Definitely. I say the comics so far, and this pulls, I'm sure, from a lot of the uh, older comics as well, but the main comics I suggested would be um, the Vision series that came out in 2013, uh, 2015, written by Tom King. Okay. And then, of course, House of M by Brian Michael Bendis that came out in the 2000s. Definitely House of M um, out of those two, in hmm. case you had to pick one. Okay. So they, if you read House of M, you'll, there's a lot mm -hmm. of hallmarks there that they have brought into the series, which is very exciting. It's very exciting. Well, we will take your word on that. Cole, how about you, sir? What have you seen here recently? Well, when you first, uh, you know, approached me to be on the show, I'm thinking, well, it's a movie show. So what is the last movie, proper movie I saw? We actually went and saw Wonder Woman 1984 in mm -hmm. the theater. Mm -hmm. And 1984 is, that time period is more etched, I think, in my own personal psyche mm -hmm. because I graduated high school in 84. Yes, I'm old people. And... <laughs> What I see, I enjoyed it. I'm okay. going to put that right up front. Sure. I mean, a lot of people pan the daylights out of this, but I enjoyed it with the caveat that it suffered heavily from Warner's incessant meddling. Okay. They can't leave creative people well enough alone. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, they are so old Hollywood. Yeah. You know, and when I spend a few million dollars on a movie, I want to have some control of the reins, old Hollywood. <laughs> but they, it, it, is very heavily steeped in the 80s mm -hmm. to the point where sometimes it's exaggerated. Yeah. 
And I think that the Maxwell Lord character, mm -hmm. the, the approach that they took with Maxwell Lord suffered from being so 80s. I mean, this was yeah. like VH1, the big 80s exploded on yeah. the Wonder Woman. Yeah. And, He's Gord the Gecko, as was my first impression of him, which I yeah. immediately like picked up on that right away. I'm like, oh, they went Gordon Gecko. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm an 80s people... fan, so I loved Wonder Woman 84, and I totally understood um, why they pulled from that era, era and exactly what they were doing, because it was like a Beastmaster 2, Superman 2. They went over the top. They had fun with it. The marketing was very neon, 1984. And um, I did a whole review about this too as well, um, because there was such, like you said, such a negative backlash. And the film really wasn't, in my opinion, deserving of such a negative backlash. It, it was just a fun that, 80s film. I mean, it wasn't that yeah. bad as people were trying to portray it. Was it a great no. movie? No. Was it as good as the first one? No. no. Was but, it about a half hour too long? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I think it also suffered from associations with the Maxwell Lord character and Donald Trump. Yeah. And it's like, no, there were guys like that a before Trump. Before Absolutely. Donald Trump. Donald you Trump mean, no. idolized Gordon Gecko. Let's put it that way. No, All those Wall Street guys. Good... Well, well this is Gordon the era Gecko. that Trump was broken out of, not to get political, but this is exactly where he came from. Yeah, it was exactly. the, yeah. It, it, yeah. He came from the era of excess and I want more and I want it all and I want it to be mm -hmm. Well, you know that life is good, but it could be better. Mm -hmm. And of course, Pedro yeah. Picasso. Yeah. Is Watch good Oliver movie. Stone's Wall Street and then you guys will have a much better idea of where they were going yeah. with that. Yeah. Educate yourself on the period and, yeah. and steep yourself in it. And yeah. It, it, it'll have a better yeah. vibe. I think it, yeah. And I think I'm probably on the other side and I'm okay with it. I'm okay with oh, being okay. the guy who doesn't like some of the stuff that everybody likes. And so to me, the movie wasn't horrible, but here's my biggest issue with the film, other than the fact that I guess it's the context. And the context is. We're now in an age where we love CGI. CGI runs most of the movies. And so to go back and show us bad CGI because you're trying to pay an homage to a certain time, I don't know that's the best thing. The second thing is we have superhero movies coming out you know, six or seven times a year. So to take two hours and 30 minutes to tell us something that we're already going to know because we've seen it, it's almost like you don't understand who's watching these movies in that sense, right? And so for me, I'm like, as a, I, love, I love films before I love the, the particular product that's out there. And, and sometimes it, it's the other way. Sometimes like Star Wars, I'll like that even over just films. But when I go to a film and I sit down as a film person, I can't give this movie a pass that I wouldn't give to other movies that, were, that do some similar mistakes. And so from that perspective, I would say Wonder Woman is a good time. I still like the first one way better. And, I, and, and even if I understand everything that they were doing, the question is why? I mean, right now we seem there's a lot of movies that keeps going back to the 80s and we keep robbing from the 80s on everything. And at some point it's like, okay, you've made it a trope to go back to the 80s every time. But I think also yeah. if you look historically, mm -hmm. you will always be lapping between 20 and 40 years. Sure. The, and of course the yeah. 80s have kind of fallen out of vogue because they're, that's too long ago now. But 90s and 2000s, or are they as iconic? I mean, the 70s and 80s just glare iconography, and I think that's the one reason. But at the same time, waiting until the third act for the big reveal of your principal villain is never a good idea. Well, yeah, and especially I mean, when the premise the, is pretty weak. I mean, yeah, the plotting for if it's about wishing, <laughs> that was a great disservice to one of Wonder Woman's top tier villains. Yeah. Precisely, they treated her like a MacGuffin. That yeah. was what that was what really annoyed me was the fact that you do have you know a a fairly fantastic, even if B-level villain in uh, this character, and Yanya treated her just like so fan service. It, exactly. it, 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 it was exactly what they did with Venom and Spider-Man 3. You're trying to cram too much in. Precisely. And then, of course, you know, the Wonder Woman villain MacGuffin mm -hmm. is a, a much more developed character. Yeah. 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 And, and, and again, this is not to say that you can't have a good time seeing the movie. So I'm, uh, Christy, I'm with you on that end. I'm just that other side that, you know, I, when I'm looking at it too, I want to be fair all the way around and I try not to let my fanboyism cloud it. And that's not, I'm not saying that's what you're doing, but for, for me, when I look at it from a film perspective, Absolutely. I'm like, if I look at this from a film perspective, I'm sorry with as many superhero films that are out there, you've got to be better than that. 
because you're putting out six or seven superhero movies a year. So how are you not getting better? I would say I would say Wonder Woman is on the upper echelon of the DC releases. I think it is, when it, if hmm. you compare it to the Marvel films, the Marvel films are much better. They're well done. They're they're much they're better written. But when it but I still like Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman eighty four to me is still up. It's still above Zack Snyder's stuff. It really is. Okay, I'm with you on that. Most I can see that. I'm just going to just drop I'm... it like it's hot right there. But yeah, I, um, I will say too. Another thing is, and I it, it, being an '80s baby and being someone who grew up in the '80s and saw these films as a kid, I totally understood right away what Patty Jenkins was trying to do. And so I kind of identified with the direction. I think the mall scene for me set it up. I'm like, oh, she's going to have fun with this. And this is going to be total 80s throwback. So I kind of strapped in and it kind of accepted it for what, what it was. Yeah. Um, versus the very the first film takes place in 1919. And it's very clear that the tones of those two films are night and day. Yes. But I think for some fans, if you come in expecting the same tone of the first film in 84, you're not going to get that. 84 is very much, again, like that. I, I use Beastmaster 2 because that one's the, you know, Beastmaster 1's more serious, <laughs> Beastmaster 2's more comical. And that same um, trope or uh, formula is used for a lot of films of the 80s. For me, though, from a woman's perspective, seeing a female at the lead of an action comic superhero film that I watched that was similar to the films I watched in 84, that was the big reveal and you know happiness for me because now I can watch this film and they put a female in the lead and now she's the strong character which I didn't really have that before in the 80s it was very male dominated for these type of films well, Wonder, Woman had, Wonder, Woman had, Wonder, Wonder Woman had a TV show in the 80s where she was definitely the lead so but I but I get what you're saying I'm, I'm certainly not disputing that. I think that's 70s. right yeah, well, it's seventy. Sorry, but it went. Yeah, but by the time we saw it, it, was the reruns. You know, by the time we were looking at, it. but but I, I do get that, and that's a good point. I'd also bring up the idea that, I, again, that's the hard part, right? So like, there's the fandom part of you that's gonna automatically love it just because of the things that you've outlined, and then there's the side of you that also sees the film side of it. And again, I don't think that she necessarily. The question would be, I get that Wonder Woman one and Wonder Woman two, if we want to call it that, are different tones. I get that. The question is why the question is why would you think that would be the better tone to go with when we've already seen it done a million times through stranger things and all these other shows that are going back to the 80s and showing stuff especially the horror films but going back to the 80s horror guys so to me i was just curious as to why she felt that there was a strong push to try to switch tones if your first tone worked why not just go to that tone and develop something different for example what i loved about mm -hmm. star wars was empire strikes back was different completely from the first one in 1977, but it still felt like you weren't jarred yeah. by it. And I think this is pretty jarring if you watch the first one and then you watch 84, well, also, you're very you jarred. Also, a 60 some odd year, 70 year sure. gap yeah. in time. So Wonder Woman's done almost nothing. <laughs> and then finally something big enough happens to bring her out. And that is the unfortunate consequence of how yeah. Yeah. Wonder Woman was handled from Justice League forward. But speaking to television, I also, yeah. this was another this good, example bro. of, I really see the studio's hand in this, is the ad campaign. This was like the Simpsons movie where all the best jokes were in the uh, trailers and in the commercials. <laughs> so when you went to go see the movie, you like had three laughs left in it because you'd already seen all the best stuff. And I think this was a similar sort of thing where they, so many things that would have been a, a fun little thing to have occur. A lot of the spontaneity was lost because some of the most spontaneous elements were already spoon fed to you. In the trailer. Yeah. yeah. No, I get that. But I, but again, Christy, I really appreciate that perspective. I'm glad that you said that we need you to say things like that because this movie isn't like a dumpster fire at all. It isn't. Yeah. It's just it is. And, and one thing I wanted to touch upon what you said, too, I'll say just a couple points real quick. Uh, please, Patty Jenkins, it, 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 I grew up in the 80s. So this so was very I, clearly her generation and what she grew up with and what she wanted to see on the screen. And she's even said that as much in interviews. And I'll say, too, when it comes to superhero movies, I think and I agree with the, the film analogy, you know, from a film perspective, what what is this film serving? I do agree with that, but I think at the same time, when we look at some superhero films, at the end of the day, is 
the superhero films for me is, does this have a good moral message at the end? Which the film did for me. It was a very positive, be true to yourself, um, essentially. And then at the same time, it's it's to have fun, you know? So I'm not gonna paint, uh, for me personally, with superhero films, I, I don't paint them with a broad brush of comparing it on like the Godfather level. Cause clearly that's sure. more of a, that's that's more like we're, we're challenging cinematic, um, you know, or challenging the history of cinema here and putting something interesting out there, telling a story and multi-generations versus Wonder Woman's gonna come in and save the day and thumbs up. So it, it just depends. You just gotta play with it and see what works for you. And I think this film ultimately was meant to give you a positive role model and have a good time. And that's what I took from it. Sure. And here's the thing, and I, I love that. And here's the, here's the only thing I'll say to that. And again, you're certainly right on. You're not wrong at all. I'll just say this. I think what's sad is when we talk about what's the best superhero film and we have to go to The Dark Knight, Christopher Nolan. All That's the best series, any trilogy of all the superhero films. Better than The Avengers, better than all the, I think most people agree with that. So the interesting thing is, is that we have to go back to something that was made back in the two, early 2000s. And but I think this, you know, this to, really comes down to speak to Christie's point. Cinema as a business. Sure. Has the option, the opportunity to be commerce or art. Right. Correct. And I think that that is the dichotomy that we always see and more often than not, out of necessity, it's commerce. Sure. So that it's commerce that drives Wonder Woman, if you're comparing it to say like The Godfather, where that was no. art. <laughs> no. I mean, yeah. they went into that like good fellas. I mean, you know, you reach a point where it's like, you can go and be the artist, here is your blank uh, plaster Sistine Chapel ceiling. Yeah. Others are like, can you guys just kind of paint this wall Kind of white, but not white. You know what I mean? Where it's not dull. And, you know, that's the difference between commerce and art. Sure. No, I, and I totally get that. And, and I, I'm just disappointed in the room for the lack of love for Howard the Duck. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> hey, hey, I hey. love Howard the Duck. There you go. I'm, I'm, of course you I do. Love Howard the Duck. <laughs> I saw Howard again, the Duck. In again, the, the Howard theater. the Duck is not trying to be the Godfather either. <laughs> okay, but see, first of all, first of all, no one brought up Godfather but you. So I don't expect these movies to be well, Godfather. What I insist on it. Hold on. Hold on, here's my show. Can I talk? Can I talk? I just want to talk here. I talk. You should have so known all better I'm to say you is, your guests. All I'm trying to say is, is that um, to me, again, I'm going to go back to we have seen evidence when these movies are made well, even yeah. if it is a superhero movie. And that's what Christopher Nolan proved when he did Dark Knight. And so Batman isn't the only comic book hero because I believe with you, I agree with you, Christy. I wanted to see Wonder Woman done as well as Batman was done in Christopher Nolan because yeah. Wonder Woman deserves it. She was one of my favorites. I loved Linda Carter back in the day. And I used to watch that show and the Six Million Dollar Man and the Bionic Woman, Jamie Summers. Oh, that yeah. was my jam. I get it. I get it. But that's why I'm going to hold him to a stronger, uh, you know, uh, yes, stringent to say, listen, if Christopher Nolan could do this with Batman, why can't we get that same level because Christopher with these Nolan others? Because Christopher Nolan was allowed to f make his trilogy hands off. To the, the most part, yes. did not come in and just breathe down his neck. And you can feel the heat of Warner Brothers' breath on this film. I'm yes. Sorry. But, uh, well, I heard that Patty Jenkins had more control of this one than she did the first one. Yeah, I think so. So that's what I heard. But either way, but I think this is a great discussion. It's a discussion that us movie nerds oh, can little, talk about little known fact. forever. <laughs> <laughs> and Chrissy, I love you. Please don't hear yeah. anything wrong. I'm just. No, no. To... I, 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 are you kidding? I. I... <laughs> Mario Puzo <laughs> created Wonder Woman. A lot of people don't know. Oh, that. yeah. I've, I've been doing movie reviews for a minute. I've, I've heard about everything come back at me. So it's all great. It's good. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I think that's what we probably go for is realism. Because if we all get on here and we all loved it and we love everything that everybody loves, then that's a growing show as far as I'm concerned. But I and love the transverse the fact. is also true. We were, true. You know, the idea of the oh, critic of is always hypercritical of every and picks the right. down to the bone. That again, the, where's the... What Agree. Is, what's drawing me in to care about what you're saying if you hate everything? Agree. And I, and I think that's the thing, though. But I think when we're talking about the properties funny. that we love, 
right? <laughs> Chances, if we talk about the properties that we love, we're probably going to be yeah, more we'll be fanboy more. than we are going to be critic. And so the thing is, I think, to me, if I criticize or if I criticize anything, it's not because I think the movie sucks and I want to nitpick it. It's because I think it could be done better. Yeah. And if that pushes it to be better, then I think we all win if the film gets better because people decided, well, hey, you know, we your could first do show was all about that, <laughs> making the movie better. <laughs> well, yeah, we used to have a, Christy, we used to have this segment called a MILF. It was called Movies I'd Like to Fix. <laughs> and, and that's what we did is we took some movies that, you know, they had a great first act, maybe a great second act, but then the third act, they ruined it. Or maybe the first two acts were so boring that you didn't wake up to the third act. And we just talked about, like, when you talk about movies, you know, it's how you feel when you leave. That's also very important. So there's the creative side of what the director wants to show you, but it's also how you, the person walking out of the theater, feels. And if the movie did nothing right. for you, that's one thing. If it did a lot for you, that's another thing. And then to your point, right. if it's all commercialized, where we're just, yeah. where they're programmed to try to get just this one feeling out of you every time, it's going to feel like a, a druggie, right? That they're just, <laughs> they're just giving you the stuff and you're just ODing on it. Cause you, and after a while, you can't tell the difference between heroin and Coke, I guess, if you just always are getting fed a certain thing. So in that Dang, end, that's, a, that's a bad day. That's a bad day in the 80s. Yes, <laughs> that's a totally bad day yeah, in the 80s. That's when Gabe was <laughs> Says you, not Robert Downey Jr. Come on. <laughs> or half of Hollywood. I guess anyway. in that way. <laughs> All right, we got to move on. PJ, yeah. what'd you yeah. watch this week? Oh, man, I was enjoying that. This other stuff sucks. Anyway, here we go. Uh, <laughs> let's get back to it. All right, that's all right. Let's talk about this stuff. You actually had so, a topic for today, too. Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, you know, topic schmuck. We're, we're all lit and ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the movie I watched, and I'll be shorter with this just because, and not, not because I, any other thing other than it's, this movie doesn't wor isn't worth it. I saw Locked Down. It's on HBO Max. This is a film that was, uh, it's a Don um, Lyman film, which you remember him from doing films. Uh, gosh, of course I would blank out now at the moment that I'm trying to think about it. Um, <laughs> but you remember him from doing Today After Tomorrow. Uh, you remember him doing Mr. and Mrs. Smith. You remember him doing Born Identity. So what Don Lyman does is he's able to do uh, films where he captures people in interesting, extraordinary situations, and then he plays them out. So in this particular film, Lockdown, it's about this couple that breaks up right before the quarantine happens, but they live together so they can't go anywhere because now they have to shelter in place, but they hate each other. So it's Anne Hathaway is the female in the relationship and the male is uh, Chidua Elfor, Elgifor. And it's really trying to show us, hey, look, what would you do if you're breaking up with your ex right before you have to get locked down with them for the next whatever, you know, yeah. every time? And so I like the actors. I think the actors were great. I love the premise. The problem was for me that it hits too close to home with what we're still dealing with. So to watch other people complaining and arguing and fighting, yeah. you're kind of going, I love you, Anne Hathaway. I thought you were great as Catwoman. And, you know, like, I some... could stay home and do this. Yes. You, it's know, like, you don't well, have to, to yeah, pay money. It, it's, or... Yes, this film to me was the equivalent of at work dealing with politics at the office and then coming home watching a show about office politics. Yeah. Like, you just don't want to unless you really like that kind of thing. Yeah. So I have to say that Lockdown, while its original premise, great actors and actresses in this, and good turns, the acting wasn't bad. It's just that as I tried to watch it, it was hard to like either one of them because they were really just being, but I understood why they were doing it. They were locked together. and But to me, that's not fun. That's not a fun time. Yeah. So I couldn't really get into it. becomes into more it. of an ordeal for the audience. Yeah. You, yeah. you share in their ordeal so intimately. Yeah. That then you're like, you know, what I have that you don't, that the characters don't have is the option to leave. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I, w I watched this too, and I have the exact same feeling on Did it. Did you, Chrissy, like, tell me, what was your thoughts on this? Because I, I, you know, I, I thought the like premise it. was knock out of the park. Yes. I thought the cast was great. Um, so I watched the trailer, and the trailer kind of advertised it as this art heist in the height of quarantine, yes. and this couple's locked together. Yes. When I watch the film, um, it's not that at all. The art heist is a very, very small last 10 minutes of the film. The bulk of the film is them kind of going through the motions of a couple, um, you know, nitpicking a lot of emotions, mm -hmm. arguing and loving each other, going back and forth uh, in the time of COVID, and then dealing what we're all dealing with now. And I think you hit the nail on the head. I think we're still all processing things right now. So seeing a film, and the film's pretty lengthy yes um, because it's just kind of it just focuses them all in the house and the cameras on them bickering and kind of arguing a little bit yes and it felt like a stage performance like theater more than 
and so I came in with the expectation, ooh, they're going to have like a little bit of this, but then it's going to lead up pretty quick to the art heist. Yes. And it, was it like did the it. domestic the art version of the lighthouse. It was like way, and it just, it was kind of anticlimactic. And so. It was. And yeah. So th that was the disappointment. So I completely agree with you. I, th I just think they just didn't quite, it needed some, it needed some edits and needed to, I don't know. There just needed to be some pacing there. Um, the 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 overall plot's great. Yes. But I think they needed a little bit more work on it personally. Yeah, that, really, yeah. it, it strikes. I haven't seen it, but it strikes me as sort of a domestic version of the lighthouse. <laughs> yes. Talk, yeah. Talk about a claustrophobic <laughs> <It's> ordeal. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and I think when the characters who you who you love them in other films when they become unlikable within the first five or ten minutes because of what they're doing. <laughs> it really robs a sort of energy from it. So, but yeah, I'm right there with you on that. Hey, Kazek, what about you, man? What did you see recently? All right, so this week I finally got the release of something that I talked about on the last show. It was it, uh, it was one that I was looking forward to as soon as I saw the trailer, and it's a film called PG, a.k.a. Psycho Gorman. <laughs> this film is amazing. It is everything I wanted this film to be and more. It is My Pet Monster meets Guar meets E.T. It is phenomenally insane. Uh, it, it's a wonderful throwback to all the uh, 80s a Alien in My Backyard movies like E.T. and stuff like that. But it's so over the top. The violence, the gore. Uh, there's no swearing. It's a, it's a kid's horror film, but it is a horror film nonetheless. And it's just absolutely amazing. All practical effects, all puppetry, uh, 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 you know, cheap, cheap effects, everything that I wanted this film to be and more. If you like this kind of film, if you like horror comedy and things like that, this is a film that you see because it's just... If you like, if you don't like this kind of film, it's not for you. But if you love going, going <laughs> throwbacks and those Alien in My Backyard movies and just over the top violence, gore, it's phenomenal. I so can't wait to watch this again because it's just that funny. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I really cannot get enough of this film. Yeah, he showed us a trailer last week at the end when we were finished taping the last show and uh yeah it was it was pretty funny so i will have to check it out oh yeah yeah the, yeah there, there are no likable characters in it and that's the most likable part of it is that no one is, <laughs> no one is likable not even the little girl who has control of the alien and when i say control i mean she is a she's a freaking dictator it's just phenomenal it. It, 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 no one is likable in the film and that's what makes it likable and, and, it just, and like i said it has so many throwbacks to you know like uh like I said, Guar and My Pet Monster and E.T. Just <laughs> all of it in just one phenomenally violent, great, funny film. I, <laughs> I think you sold it by saying it's gory, has no swear words, but it's based off gore and it's for kids. I think that sentence yeah. right there should have yeah. just put, boom. I, I, I didn't know there was a kid's horror genre like that, that. There totally is, and this one's definitely there. <laughs> was that that one scary movies was supposed to be something based off of for children? You mean Goosebumps? Go well, there's Goosebumps, but there's one also called Scary Stories or something. Scary yeah, Stories to Tell in the Dark. Uh, scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. That's it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, I think that first segment went really well. What do you yeah. think, people watching? So <laughs> what we're going to do now is we're going to slide right into our main topic of the day. And that is... We are now going to talk about our favorite streaming services and then some. So as we could start off with, we know that right now, the only way you're going to watch most movies is through streaming services, especially if it's going to come out the same time it comes in the theater. Most people are probably going to stay home and watch it. So I want to start with um, Jedi Cole here first and just kind of get a sense of your favorite streaming services. And then also, we talked about something. Yeah, we had a little discussion you... about streaming in general. You want to yeah, let's go with that. With let's that. do that. and then... Yeah, because a couple of things. Also, you brought up you know most people staying home and watching movies on stream the same time they're in the theater mm -hmm. I just to me the, the, the demise of the, the cinema mm -hmm. the actual physical building going out of your way to go to a movie has been decried for about the last 35 years Yeah, I've watched the end of the movie theater being bandied about while they're building giant megaplexes <laughs> on the other side of town for decades yeah Will this finally portend the the beginning of the end? I doubt it, but at the same time, I just I feel like this is catering to the segment who are oh I'll just wait and watch it on 
mm-hmm. VHS or mm-hmm. DVD or Blu-ray as we go on. Right. Laser disc. Um, <laughs> and it's just making it more convenient for them. They don't have to wait. Yes. Because those people were never going to set foot in the movie theater in the first place for most pictures. It is very much a product of COVID mm-hmm. as well. It's addressing that. But I'll still go out and brave the movie theater because I still love that experience. But the other thing with this, speaking of the streaming, the, the streaming war has begun, or the streaming glut, I should say. It's not really a war. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other day we're watching some you know, documentary or nature type show. And then here, here's Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs talking about how you can get 150,000 different Discovery family shows and movies and stuff on their new platform. And, you know, already I've got Netflix and Amazon, but, you know, Amazon has that sort of side benefit if you buy a lot of crap, Mm -hmm. uh, which I do. I probably spent as much (laughs) on stuff I bought from Amazon (laughs) as I would have spent on shipping had I had to pay it. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, we've got Netflix and Amazon already, and then Disney comes along like, damn you, Disney. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we got the CBS All Access for a while, to, especially for Picard and mm-hmm. um, Lower Decks. But again, we'll get to those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. But you, you know, it seems like the more you want to see, the idea is, oh, you know, instead of us like just sort of selling piecemeal, we'll have the entire catalog, and you can conjure up entire seasons of everything you ever want to watch instantly. But at what point? are we as consumers going to realize mm. that the more this perpetuates, we're going to go from, say, spending 60 or 50 or $60 for cable. Granted, if some show was on, you saw that episode, you saw the next one, the next one, chances are you might have to wait to see 10 episodes back, mm-hmm. where now you can just conjure it up. But are we going to go from this to paying... 150 200 250 dollars a month and not realize we're doing it because we're doing it piecemeal yeah oh it's okay it's just ten dollars a month Mm -hmm. on top of these 90 or 100 Mm dollars combined of all these others you've already got Mm -hmm. and you know then you have to determine what is the benefit um frankly for me cbs all access doesn't offer me enough to warrant its cost versus Disney, which is just constantly shoveling new things my way. So, mm-hmm. but that's another tale. But yeah, it, yeah. It, it is a worrisome trend because people aren't going to realize. And then what's going to happen is the whole thing collapses. Mm-hmm. And, and much like with the Warner streaming, yeah, Warner realized it was a dead end game. I think mm-hmm. in many ways before anybody else. Hmm. Okay. And that yeah. will remain to be yeah. seen if that was the case. Well, it is interesting. And I think the biggest thing to be worried about or concerned about is if you are excited and then everybody strategically places certain shows that they know you want to watch, but on different channels, exactly. if you end up spending just as much as cable, then why did you cut the cable? If you're still, exactly. You just found another way to spend Everybody's all that money. So, proud about so, the cable and so that would be, that would definitely all that money right back in and more. Right. And I think that's the thing where that would, where we'd have to be careful. But in the meantime, in between time, yeah, while we're enjoying it, while we're enjoying it. <laughs> so which this is a golden age. So, uh, my top, Streaming right now is, of yeah. course, Disney because okay. on I remember seeing a, a post like days before it launched, Disney mm-hmm. Plus launches, and I got tired of scrolling mm-hmm. to look at all of everything that was dumped from, mm-hmm. you know, from the title standpoint, it was either a movie or a television series, mm-hmm. which meant, you know, a series just adds that much more content. But I was scrolling and scrolling like, good Lord, I was a child when I saw these, you know, I saw the Shaggy DA at the Wynwood Theater in Dallas, dear, dear Lord, and now I can just, <laughs> I can demand it at, at will at three in the morning. And I'm like, this thing already has so much going for it. Mm-hmm. And I enjoy a lot of Disney stuff. I'm not a Disney movie buff, mm-hmm. but Disney now holds the reins of things that I am Mm -hmm. big on, like the Marvel cinematic and especially the Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Mandalorian hits and it's like, oh, Star Wars is back. God bless you. Mm -hmm. And then, what, a few weeks ago, they're like, you know, while we're at it, let's just 
dump between Marvel and Star Wars alone like 30 new shows. Yeah. Which means hours and hours of content. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, the, the movies notwithstanding, sure. they'll eventually wind up there as well. Mm -hmm. And then now you can get the Muppet Show. Yep. Disney owns three quarters of my childhood, officially. That's right. There you go. There and, you I've go. Waiting, and I've been waiting for that Muppet Show dump for a while. Yeah, and I, I just want to oh, pretend yeah. like it's like the family gathering around the TV set back in the... Sure. In the, in the 80s. And it, <laughs> yeah. and it still is now gathered around their own devices. So That's true. <laughs> That's true. And, and so with that, so Chrissy, I know the same thing for you, but let's, let's hear about your favorite services and kind of maybe what it is that you like watching the most on there or what do you think is the big advantage to that particular streaming service? Ex uh, well, wow. So uh, I, I have a lot of streaming services and I, I'm not ashamed to admit it because okay. there's, a, there's a lot of information I like taking in. Yes. Um, so Disney Plus, for instance, we'll focus on that real quick. I loved um, Disney Plus's rollout. Um, I was one of the early adopters of it. And um, I love how they categorize like Disney, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars and National Geographic. Yes. Um, I'm kind of an archaeology nerd. Okay. So the National Geographic was just kind of like the, the cherry on top. Yes, and then exactly. as they've been rolling out, like they just dropped, you know, Isle of Dogs, Wes Anderson's newest film. And yeah, they have yeah. a very interesting catalog. Like they just have our childhood too, because one thing that got me in the beginning, it's like they have the X-Men, the animated series. And it's like, <laughs> oh my God, I, I'm going, like the, the theme song to that series alone is, is my entire childhood. But you're going to find, of course, <laughs> The Mandalorian, which to me is one of my favorite things happening uh, as of 2020 for sure. And um, they just, just know how to play it. Now they're unrolling the X-Men films on there, and it makes it really, really exciting for me. Um, my second one that I was very excited about for streaming was HBO Plus, uh, or uh, HBO Max, excuse me. That impressed me, their yeah. catalog. I wish their advertising on it in the beginning was a little bit stronger, but then at the same time, I'm not, not that mad about it because I felt like I was in early. <laughs> I feel like the collector who got in the first 10 and Cole knows exactly what I'm talking about. I was like, yeah, that's number eight. Yeah, um, yeah, but, Benicio Del Toro kind of, mm. Right? <laughs> but when I got in there, the first thing I saw was TCM and all mm -hmm. their digital copies of Criterion films, and yep. I lost wow. my mind. Yes. And then I'm a, I'm a DC uh, a Universe subscriber, so seeing all those DC films now categorized, now I've got Marvel over here and DC over here. Harley Quinn season two. They actually have the older Green Lantern animated series, um, which wow. has been amazing to, to revisit. Um, Studio Ghibli, I mean, we can't go wrong with that. And then, of course, you got Looney Tunes and Sesame Workshop. Mm. Of course, because uh, uh, I'm about nostalgia and I love revisiting these things too. And then some of the HBO originals um, have been really good. Like I binged The Undoing with Nicole Kidman and I thought it was brilliant. So it, there's just a, between these two, you have a really interesting, diverse mix of lots of different things. And I find myself just, you know, I want to watch Studio Ghibli one day and then I'm watching a James Stewart film the next, and I kind of like that. And that's kind of how I like to travel between these streaming services. Yeah. No, that's, I love that take. That's, that's interesting. I love how you stated that. How about you, Kay Zach? What's, what's interesting to you out there in well, terms of streaming? Well, for me, um, I go more towards some of the niche stuff because, again, I'm, you're I'm, such a niche. I'm a little out there. I'm a little <laughs> out there. Uh, the first one that I'll take a look at uh, is uh, AMC's offering called Shudder. Uh, Shudder is nice. a Shudder is a horror oriented surprise, surprise. Uh, <laughs> a horror oriented streaming service, and it's it's wonderfully diverse in the horror that it gets because not only is it getting it, it's now getting into like a hammer horror and 60s horror but you're also getting some of the great uh giallo films some of the great uh, italian uh, uh crazy horror but also you're getting classics from the 80s stuff that you haven't seen like blade birthday april yeah. fool's day stuff like that uh and you're also getting some great original programming you're getting uh uh eli roth's history of horror you're mm -hmm. getting uh 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 Cursed Films, which is a look at uh, uh, films with, uh, you know, crazy histories. Uh, you're also getting, which is the reason why I got it, Joe Bob's Last Drive-In. So you're <laughs> getting that old curated <laughs> horror, which, you know, like I said, the horror host. And you've got, you've got three streaming channels on there. You've got... Uh, uh, you've got uh, recommendations from uh, classic slashers. You've got... 
you've got just a wonderful diverse look but again like i said why the reason why i call it niche program is because it's designed for the horror fan yeah. it's not it's mm -hmm. not gonna it's gonna it's a, it's a lower price point so you get all that but like i said you don't mind paying it because you're getting some of this wonderfully curated stuff you're also getting the original stuff like creep show uh from nicotero from greg nicotero uh, uh okay TV. okay uh, uh, you're getting some wonderful series, and also you're getting uh, looks from uh, AMC's channels uh, from Walking Dead. Uh, you're getting, uh, I think, history of comic books, which uh, uh, Robert Eastman, or uh, not Eastman, God, not Kevin Eastman, God, uh, uh, Robert Kirkman, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you're getting uh, just some wonderful stuff if you're into this kind of genre. If you're into horror, you're getting absolutely that. Um, the second one that I took a look at, it's two uh, streaming services which are more geared towards television. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is going to be uh, Pluto TV. Pluto TV has, uh, for free and with ads, uh, a small uh, a selection of uh, movies and TV series on demand. But what the real draw is, is of course TV series because you have... Uh, it's kind of like going through older channels. You're going through stuff like there's a Kung Fu channel that's just all Kung Fu 24 mm -hmm. hours a day. Mm -hmm. uh, you're getting all horror films. You're getting all sci-fi films. You're getting a stream of uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000, mm -hmm. riff tracks just all day. I mean, it's something that you want to put, if you want something to put on, you've got something to put on. It's it's non-programmed. After they watch this show, of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Christy's show and Cole's show. <laughs> Because yeah. you got to watch these shows first before you go to the big boy. Or, no, you just watch kidding. them each other. Yes. And then watch. <laughs> right. But also, you're getting, uh, uh, you know, older TV stuff like, you know, Mork and Mindy, Happy Days. Uh, Gunsmoke. Uh, yeah. Gunsmoke again. Uh, just all kinds of good old stuff. Wow. The other one I the other one I looked at is Tubi TV. Uh, Tubi TV, again, uh, it was more to be fun. To be Exactly. It was more fun before Fox <laughs> took it over because there was just a wonderful selection of B movies that you get, that oh, if you were digging yes. it, you're digging. I mean, I'm finding stuff like Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, Spider Baby, just all kinds of weird stuff Spider that Baby. no one knows about unless you're one of these films. And again, if you're, it's kind of like, it's a lot of the films that you can get on Shutter, you can get on Tubi for free. So I won't, hmm. so I won't dispute that. But like I said, you're getting it with ads and things like that. And like I said, they've got a they've got a couple A tier movies, but also a whole bunch of B and C stuff. Which if you're into the B and C stuff, you're in. Yeah, that's, no, that's I funny. love it. I love it. Oh, you know, in fact, I was so into the Disney Plus, I forgot to mention a second service uh, yeah. on my own part, and it's the old standby Netflix. I Netflix continues to at intervals impress. Because they will sneak stuff in. Uh, we just started the uh, history of swear words with Nick Cage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely yes. brilliant because that's mm -hmm. one of those things that would suffer from presentation. Mm -hmm. And they worked out a way to present this and mm -hmm. make it fun and engaging and hilarious. And uh, Christy had mentioned on uh, Disney Plus, I did want to address on the, the National Geographic. Mm -hmm. If you have not watched The World According to Jeff Goldblum, and I can't wait, I'm, there has to be a second season. I'm sure it yeah. ran smack into COVID because you can't have the touch-feely Jeff Goldblum. I'm all about that 3D, 40 feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> You, you, I'm, I'm a Jeff so. Goldblum fan. You have to pretty much vaccinate all of the world so that Jeff Goldblum can go and, and be all touchy with them again. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that will come. This but, is going to be a completely different video in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. Aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> but, but check, check that out check out the history of swear words that's a lot of fun i, I love it i love it and so i would say and i know we're pressed up against time so we're i will good. i will we're make good. sure we got about 10 minutes we get good 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 so uh, here's what i was looking at when i when it came to streaming again and, and this is something again those kzak's idea is a great idea so when it comes to streaming i thought okay well I'm a systematic thinker and then a non-systematic thinker. So I, I get Christopher Nolan when he's linear, but then he goes unlinear to tell a story. So to me, I was thinking with a streaming service, it needs to, for me, say, I, the questions I would ask are, how good are the originals? How good are the archived films that it has or the older films? How easy it to use, is it to use? And then how often do you actually watch it? Like, does it pull you in enough to where you just want to go into it? And so for me, and my money, I, I was thinking... 
uh, and it seems kind of obvious to a degree, but it was Netflix and Disney. Now, let me tell you why Netflix. Netflix has put out 20, uh, I'm sorry, 1,200 original titles in the last four years. Netflix has people like Martin Scorsese doing films like The Irishman, which was Oscar nominated. The Cobra Kai, they bought that up from another uh, station to bring it on. From YouTube. And, exactly, to go where they're going. And the list goes on and on. Netflix is the king because they've been doing it a lot longer. They understand the game that they're playing. And then there's stuff like the shows that I wanted to see, like uh, The Get Down, which would have never been made, which is told from Nas's perspective about the starting of hip-hop, but through the story of these children living in Brooklyn, where hip-hop was born, right? And so where do you get stuff like that, that goes back, that also has that nostalgia of the 80s, where you're wearing the Shilto Adidas and all that stuff, yeah. and the Adidas jackets and stuff, and where that came in, right? And, and the fedora. Pretty much the game. Yes, the yes. <laughs> yes. Chrissy's right there with it. So with that... How do you so Netflix is the giant, and as long as they continue to keep putting out these movies, now they are losing money, they report as well. But I imagine they're making it back on some end with something, some sort of endorsements or something on the other end because and probably in many expensive. ways, like licensing as well. If their own mm -hmm. their ownership of their properties, like say Stranger Things, yes, there, you know, that was a money truck for a while, yeah, because there was so much merchandising. Yeah. But also, you know, Netflix is king because they pretty much invented the game. They morphed yeah, out of OG. A, mm -hmm. yes. a rental service yes. and started doing the unthinkable and creating original content as well as streaming existing content. It's like, wait, why are we doing that? And now we know. Yes. Yeah, and we, we totally know. And, and I think that the, and I think Disney has, has come in and has gave us a good push. We wanted to feel good about Star Wars again, and that's that's been accomplished. You can watch this with your kids. So if you have younger kids in the house, you know, and your mom trying to pass on, or your dad trying to pass on some of your favorite things to them, it's very easily done. So I think that's coming. But I would say my second one, then, and I give Disney Plus kind of the honorable mention, would probably be Prime because of shows like Jack Ryan. Right. That's a very original piece by with John Krasinski in it, who gave us a quiet place and to see new budding actors who are then switching to the other side of the camera, putting new, fresh ideas out there, I think is pretty good. Now, they've got a way to go, but Prime is not going to lose us because Amazon Prime has everybody with the things you're going to buy. But I think those are the ones from kind of the wide access, easy to use. How often do I use it? Are there good archived old stuff on these channels? Yes, there are. Uh, does it meet the originals thing? Check. So I think that's kind of how I had to break it down to see which one I think I might use. And I know that there's up and coming ones coming, like Paramount, which has Yellowstone. And if you're not watching Yellowstone, you're really missing what I think is the second coming of what Breaking Bad would be if you put it in Montana and made it about uh, these guys that are trying to save a land that was passed over from the father, from the great-grandfather to the great-grandfather to the great-grandfather. You have a great villain in Kevin Costner who's sometimes the villain, sometimes he's not. Sometimes you're going, look, they're really just trying to take his land because they think they can. Yeah. But then how would you defend it if that was your land handed off to you? What means would you go through to keep it when you have billionaire uh, developers trying to come in, an Indian reservation that's fighting you, and a whole bunch of all these things? So if you haven't seen Yellowstone, it's on Paramount. It's one of those gems that's going underneath the radar because it's on Paramount, and Paramount's not very well developed. I wish it was on Netflix because yes. if it were... I think people would be talking about this like they were Breaking Bad because it's that intense and you could see the plausibility of a lot of it. Yeah. One, one thing I, I do want to touch on Please. really quickly is, you know, at the, at the opening, I spoke to the glut. Yes. But at the same time, you can't escape the fact that a byproduct of that glut is the preservation and presentation. Like Zach said, you know, there's hundreds of horror B movie horror films you would yep. never get to see. They made like once in every five years, somebody might pick it up on a service or show it on television. But here is this opportunity to see every film ever made <laughs> in every language. And, you know, uh, it very much comes down to a thing I saw in Comedy Central years ago where uh, they were arguing, they were doing like a fake debate show, and Patton Oswald was talking, uh, defending the internet. As, or um, as being sort of like, it's made us all into little Caesars. You know, we can demand anything we want. It'll be presented before us. He's like, I want to see a pooping panda. And there it is. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing now with every movie or television show. You know, you can, if I want Leave it to Beaver or I want 
the Irishman. Or if you want a pooping panda film, you just go at Adam Sandler. And there you are. There you go. <laughs> well, Great. I was going to say, too, with all these streaming services, it has actually, this competition has um, encouraged preservation, like to what Jedi Cole is saying, is because all these streaming services are having to find their own niche. What are we excelling at? Yes. You know, and then, you know, H HBO has their own. You know, Disney, of course, has Marvel and Star Wars. Shudder has the horror market. You know, Netflix has that original content um, that, that kind of threw itself into. So it's, it, it is, it's preservation, it's creation of new content. Um, but at the same time, that competition is healthy because it's pu it pushes each one of them to strive for something better and more unique. And as a person who, well, at least from my point of view, who just loves film, I love seeing just all kinds of things. I'll give it to Netflix, though. And Amazon Prime is kind of picking up on this, too, just making really interesting stuff that you know executives would pass this stuff over. But now <laughs> we're hearing voices from everyone. And I really love the direction that's going because... You know, you can only hear the same rom-com, cookie-cutter kind of plot. And then you get into other shows where, like, oh, this is a little weird. I kind of like this. And you know, this is kind of what I need. I want to be challenged as a film goer. I also want escapism and to be entertained as well. So I like it all. I think it's all going in a good direction right now. And I think in yes. many ways it's actually sort of forced the hand of mainstream television. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, yeah. they're always going to fall back on those cookie cutters, but I think they're also starting to take the kind of chances. But mm -hmm. speaking to what Christy was saying, you know, you'd never have got Jean-Claude Von Johnson right in this country, <laughs> ever. <laughs> and is the most quirky, eccentric, ridiculous, but brilliant. I loved piece Briscoe of County Jr. as a kid. But that's something they kind of did a one-off of. Like Quantum Leap, loved it, one-off. Yeah. But now we're heading into that territory where they're taking those chances again and they're putting things that are kind of strange. And let's combine science fiction and a Western with Bruce Campbell. Why not? You know, and, yeah, and just having that. fun with it, you know. We need more Briscoe, just putting that out there. <laughs> Briscoe County Jr. Jr., it's fine. It's fine. Because <laughs> Bruce, Bruce is going to look at that and go, I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, he, would, he would be happy to play the, uh, the the father of the new Briscoe. <laughs> oh, man. Briscoe County, the Briscoe third. Briscoe. All right, well, guys, we got to get yeah, out of here, yo. I see the sign on Kazak's face. So yes. um, let's move into now our shout outs, who we're gonna give a shout out to. And so Christy, who do you wanna give a shout out to? A uh, shout out to, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I think right now, well, um, local nonprofit that I'm a part of called Art Love Magic, that's always a good shout out. We, um, right now, just cause of COVID, we've been kind of locked down on events, but we always pause, post positive local news and things to inspire creatives. Mm. Um, also too, um, if you like films and stuff, check out um, Jedi Goddess Christy on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, myself and the crew get together. There we go. JediGoddess.com for film reviews. And then our Facebook, we post a lot. Of, we just have fun. We keep it fun and light. If you like films, you'll like hanging around us. Awesome. And uh, Kazak, who are you shouting out to? Uh, I am shouting out, of course, uh, uh, everyone here on DallasOnAir.com. Uh, tune in to uh, just some of our uh, other fantastic shows. If you dig sports, check out 12 Pack. Check out, check out Best for Business. Uh, we have just so much stuff. You have Say Something. You have uh, DFW Raw. You've got so many uh, cool things on here. And, of course, uh, shout-outs to uh, uh, Jansen and Catherine uh, for uh, uh, getting their uh, new charity launched. Uh, like I said, uh, check out uh, more information on Dallas On Air uh, for uh, info on that. And, of course, uh, 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 just uh, shout-outs to uh, everyone watching. So thank you, guys. Awesome. And Jedi Cole, who are you shouting out to? Well, I want to shout out to uh, Andrew Farmer up in Ohio, for one, because, uh, yeah. yeah, we miss you down here in Texas, buddy. Yes, we do. Uh, he and I, for over 10 years, or close to 10 years now, have been producing uh, up to a weekly basis, Hey Kids Comics, on the JediCole.com. Uh, I am trying desperately to get that back updated again. COVID kind of kicked me in the soft places there. Uh, but you can still find Hey Kids Comics uh, wherever you find your podcast. I'm always amazed to find that we're like, how did we wind up on this service? And apparently that just sort of happens. Uh, but uh, 
We also launched a new show a few months ago. We're now alternating between Hey Kids Comics and All the Toys, not to be confused with Isle of Toys here on uh, DallasOnAir.com. Yeah. And uh, of course, a big uh, shout out to the folks putting on the Retro Palooza swap meet um, on the 30th in Arlington at the Bob Duncan Center in Vandergriff Park, where I used to produce toy shows back in the day. And Mrs. Jedi Cole and I will be out there selling whatever I have left over from my old days and toy shows and such. And, uh, and again, a big thank you to Dallas on Air. I've been a part of this family for so long now. Uh, Isle of Toys is over three years old. The Ranker Pit Live is, what is it, like almost seven now? And, Something like that. And it's just, it seems like yesterday that we sat down in a meeting over on at Deep Elm on air with Jansen and formulated what became the Rancor Pit Live. So uh, I'm just really proud to be a part of this family and I'm, I'm really thrilled that people that I know and, and enjoy are part of it as well. That's awesome. And my shout outs are going to go to the viewers, the folks who are actually watching and supporting the show and, and telling us online that, hey, we appreciate this. We think it's great. So we want to thank Mad Mel out there. She's always watching. She's always commenting. We, we love you for that. Uh, Barry and Barry, uh, Barry and Barbara Austin, um, uh, Tom, uh, Harry Thomas, who's also a film reviewer, also watches this show. So I think it's cool when film reviewers watch yeah. your show too, as well. Uh, and also uh, Scott and Laney up in Indiana are watching the OG himself, Carlos Salinas, who is the co-host for the first two years of the show. I'm pretty sure he's still supporting with us. And uh, Johnny Flicks, who couldn't be here today, who's my normal co-host, uh, he is at his daughter's birthday party oh. today, so oh, he couldn't be birthday. here. So the happy birthday to my her! Daughter's birthday. That's exactly <laughs> it. So, so to he you. <laughs> so to you, all you viewers out there, we thank you for watching today. We'll see you again. As you know, we're on the second and the fourth Sunday of every month, alternating with cold shows, the first and third Sunday. That's right. And that means that the next show will be Valentine's Day. It'll be the 14th. February 14th will be our first show in nice. February. So Kazak and I will get our pencils together and start sharpening them up and figuring out what we should talk about then. That doesn't sell us out if we're diabetics and can't eat all the chocolate that comes out during Valentine's Day. But we'll figure it out. We'll, there'll be something to figure out with that. So until then, we are out of here. We will see y'all. Everybody, let them know. Whoa!